members. Let's put our focus on tonight's program and let me do a little brief overview of what Teresa has given me regarding the description of the program and how she's gonna present information. Uh, a process for becoming a US citizen has been in place since our country's early history. Guest presenter, Teresa Steinkamp McMillan, will discuss the history and procedural changes of the US naturalization process. Finding naturalization records is an important part of researching our immigrant ancestors. We will use a few examples to explain the steps to finding these records. Some background on Teresa herself. Teresa Steinkamp McMillan is a certified genealogist. She is author of The Guide to Hanover Military Records, 1514 to 1866 on microfilm at the Family History Library. She is the owner of Lynn Street Research, a company dedicated to helping people discover their German ancestry. Uh, recently, she created and recorded two courses for Ancestry Academy at Ancestry.com. She has taught at the Institute of Genealogy and Historical Research, reading German Gothic script found in German records prior to the mid 1900s is second nature to her. So all you, all you Germanic genealogy researchers, I'm hoping she left you her contact information in her handout. In but if you're, if you're doing German research, she's the person you want to get a hold of. As far, and also to view her blog. Um, researching ancestors in Chicago and other areas of the Midwest is another of Teresa's specialty areas. She is a member of the NGS Society, the Association of Professional Genealogists, as well as many German and local genealogical societies. Teresa chairs the committee for the Board for Certification of Genealogists monthly webinar series. And finally, after all of that that she does, she is actually still a genealogy volunteer at the Arlington Heights Memorial Library in Arlington Heights, Illinois. So with that being that we're a Zoom program now, for all of us, let's give Teresa our warm standard Schomburg Township District Library welcome. All right, thank, thank you, you so Teresa. much. Thank you, Teresa, you can go ahead. <laughs> okay, thank you so much, Tony. And I don't know how to follow this after your announcement, but I'll just say we're all going to miss you. I, I think I'm speaking for almost everybody or everybody out there. So we're, you, they've got big shoes to fill. You will be missed. Okay, let's talk about naturalization, shall we? So uh, tonight's topic is a very broad, wide, uh, deep topic. I mean, you could spend probably a week, nonstop, 40 hours or more, learning about all the nuances of the naturalization process throughout the history of our country. Uh, what we're doing tonight is what I consider a primer. I'm just gonna give you the high level. It's gonna be enough to get you started and it's gonna be enough to, uh, for you to start researching uh, naturalization records if you haven't already for your ancestors. So, but, but there's a lot, you know, you're probably gonna run across situations in your own research where you're going to find the need to go deeper to uh, find out why certain things are happening that might not make sense. So what exactly is naturalization? Well, this naturalization, let me first of all say, it's a legal act or process, but it's different from immigration, okay? Immigration and naturalization oftentimes get lumped together. So immigration is the process of somebody arriving into the country, be it by, uh, you know, in the old days by ship, uh, maybe in later times by plane or however, mode of whatever mode of transportation, but it's the process of somebody arriving in the country. Naturalization is the legal process or act of somebody becoming a citizen of the United States. Um, so not everybody that arrived became naturalized. I think uh, it's important to know that. So 
This process of becoming naturalized allows a non-citizen person to acquire the nationality of that country. And of course, tonight we're going to be talking about US citizenship. Uh, this process could be automatic or it could be by statute. Uh, so, so we'll talk about some of those situations where somebody isn't actually filing their own individual papers where they kind of become a citizen automatically. So we'll talk about some of those. So why would somebody choose to naturalize? Well, it's a very important decision or a very personal decision that is going to vary from one person to another. Um, some, some might feel that they just want to become a part of their new homeland and, and they see that naturalizing is a way to do that. Uh, you get voting privileges. So uh, that would be another reason to become a naturalized citizen. Now, in the 1800s, uh, there may have been impacts on land acquisition. So such as, uh, you know, acquiring land in Oregon, you know, people who followed the Oregon Trail to acquire land out there, there were some naturalization requirements to them getting that free land. Um, now, in Indiana, there was a time when people could vote as long as they had filed a declaration of intention. So they didn't necessarily have to go through the whole process of becoming a citizen. So there are nuances to that. So voting laws are, uh, are controlled by the state. Um, and so, so that would be something where in, in certain states, they might have a different uh, voting law and, and, and different requirements for what your naturalization status had to be or your citizenship status. Um, and then, of course, we talked about the Donation Land Claim Act of 1850 that required a person to become a citizen in order to, um, to take possession or take ownership of land in, in Oregon. So those are some reasons that people might want to naturalize or might have wanted to naturalize. And when I'm talking about naturalization, I'm talking about historical uh, that's going to impact our ancestors in a genealogical uh, time frame. So we're first we're going to talk about the early US laws that impacted naturalization. So the first real naturalization law, once our once we became a country, this this naturalization law was instituted in 1790. And you'll notice in the parentheses there, I have um, the the statute um, citation. And I'm going to show you in a little bit later. Uh, how to actually go online and find the full verbiage of each one of these laws if you're so inclined to read all the details. And a lot of times I think when you're researching your ancestor, when you're finding those weird things that you don't know why they're happening, it does help to go look at the full text of the law to figure out what, what was in, what was out. So this first law in 1790, um, it applied to free white persons. It does not specify. Um, it does not specify gender at this point. And notice that there is um, th that it does only apply to white people. Unfortunately, um, the residence was for at least two years. In other words, you had to be a resident in the United States for at least two years before you be could become a citizen. And you had to be a resident in the state where you were living for at least one year. And you could apply in any court of record. Okay, and that's where naturalization research gets tricky because you don't quite know exactly what, what court they were going to apply in. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a bit. But at this point in 1790, becoming naturalized was a one-step process. You, as long as you met this criteria, you could go file one document on one day in court and become a citizen. Now in 1795, there was a modification made to this. So the residency was increased to five years instead of two years. And uh, the person had to have filed a declaration of intention at least three years before the application. So now in 1795, the process of naturalizing is a two-step process. And I think that if you've done any kind of naturalization research, uh, you're kind of probably more familiar, familiar with this two-step process of filing a declaration of intention and then your final papers or your naturalization. 
So this uh, statute in 1795 further defined what types of courts where one could apply, but, uh, but still there was a broad range of what level court. Could have been federal court, could have been state court, could have been a local court where they could apply. In 1798, the residency was increased from five years to 14 years and you had to have filed a declaration of intention at least five years before the application. Okay, so they bumped up that time frame. Um, the, so the clerks of court at this point in 1798 were to register all aliens who entered the United States. So let me say that again. The clerks of court were to register all aliens who entered the United States. It didn't matter even if they weren't planning on becoming naturalized, they were supposed to document everybody coming in. So this is a precursor to our passenger lists. The passenger list laws weren't implemented until 1820. So at this point in time, if you've got an ancestor, even though they did not naturalize, if they came into the United States in this time frame from after June of 1798, uh, technically they should have been listed uh, at a local court close to the place where they arrived. Okay, so keep that in mind, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. So in 1802, this residency requirement was decreased from 15 years back to five years. All right, so that was the only time that, it, that there was a 14-year um, require, residency requirement. That was the longest residency required, and it, and it only lasted for four years. Uh, they have to, in 1802, they changed the, the time span between the declaration of intention before the application. So that went from five years back to three years, okay? And, um, and then in 1804, we have another change to the naturalization law, which impacted women and children. So this is one of the first times we hear uh, gender being specified or minor children. So a woman, a, a woman who was the wife of a man who died after filing his declaration, but before completing his naturalization process, the, his women and children could become citizens. Um, they would have to go in and, and uh, put in an oath of allegiance. But beyond that, they could go ahead and become citizens if the man died before he completed the naturalization process. Then in 1824, we had a change where aliens who were minors upon arrival in the United States, once they reached the age of 21, so this is, they were minors when they came into the country, they came in with their parents, presumably, once they reached the age of 21, and they had lived in the United States for at least five years, they could become naturalized without filing a declaration of intention. So they could just go in and submit their final papers and become a citizen once they reached the age of 21. And here, um, let's see, this is also, they had another change to the declaration of intention where the declaration of intention could be filed two years before becoming naturalized. That was shortened from three years. Okay, and this law right here in 1824 is about the last major naturalization legislation that went into effect up until 1906. In 1906, there were, there were major changes to naturalization legislation. But um, from 1824, for the, for the kind of um, mainstream, your, your, uh, you know, the majority of people who were becoming naturalized were under these rules from 1824 to 1906. And I'm going to talk about some more um, uh, exceptions to that in a little bit. Now, in 1828, there was an al that alien registration requirement. We remember in 1798, anybody coming into the United States, whether they were going to become a citizen or not, had to register. And this was repealed in 1828. And I don't know this for sure, but I've got to imagine that has something to do with the, um, with the passenger lists that were now being maintained. So if you had anybody that came into the country between 1798 and 1828, uh, 
take a look and see if you can find them on an alien registration. And I'll, I'll show you an example of one of those in a little bit and give you some ideas on how to find those in a little bit. So that, that's really not a naturalization record, but it kind of went into the naturalization um, you know, laws or was instituted with the naturalization laws. In 1855, uh, the alien wives of U.S. citizens were granted citizenship. So that means that if a man became a citizen, his wife automatically uh, attained citizenship at that time, and and the, and vice versa. If um, you know, if an alien woman marries a man who is already a citizen, she became a citizen. Now the reverse was not true. Okay, if uh, if a woman who was a citizen who was born in the United States, married a man who was an alien, he did not become a citizen. So it, it wasn't reciprocal. And we've got some, uh, in, in the 1900s, we got some interesting things that I'll talk about a little bit later about women losing citizenship if they married a man who was an alien. So in 1862, Aliens um, who were honorably discharged from the U.S. Army could become citizens without filing a declaration of intention. So a lot of people, this kind of messes some people up sometimes because it is a little confusing. Um, sometimes people assume, and, so, and indeed some of the people in 1862 assumed that just because they had been honorably discharged from the Army that they were automatically citizens. They were not. They still had to go file those final papers in order to become a citizen. It's just that they didn't have to go through a two-step process. So they still had to go uh, do something at the court to file that final paper to become a citizen. In 1870, naturalization was opened to people of, of African nativity or descent. And at that point, this is not an automatic where um, African Americans were not given um, citizenship automatically. They still had to file and go through the naturalization process. Okay, now we're up to 1906, and now we've got some major uh, changes happening to naturalization law. So um, in 1906, the INS was created. That's the Immigration and Naturalization Service. It created a uniform system for recording naturalizations, and local courts still issued naturalizations, but all of those forms were now sent to the federal government. So before this, all of these naturalization documents that were created at all these different levels of uh, different courts throughout the United States before 1906, they were not all sent to the federal government and kept in one central repository, which is why when I said earlier, it is a little tricky to do this naturalization research before 1906. Um, in Cook County, we had several courts, and I, and I assume here that, well, I know we've got people from all over uh, the United States and possibly the world on this call, but uh, because, because we're located in Cook County here, because the Schomburg Library is located here, I got to imagine at least some of you are doing some Cook County research. So I'm putting this in here. So the Cook County courts that handled naturalizations were the criminal court that handled those up to 1906, along with the county court, now the Superior Court and the Circuit Courts in Cook County, these are all county level courts, um, they handled naturalizations up until the end of 1929. And then also in the Chicago area, we had the United States District Court at Chicago. That's a federal level court that was located in Chicago and they handled naturalizations from 1927 up to the present time. So in 1924, Native Americans were granted citizenship. So up to that time, some tribes, some individual tribes had been granted citizenship with um, due to prior agreements with the United States. But this act in 1924 covered all of the remaining Native American tribes that weren't already um, handled by prior agreements. And this was an automatic um, citizenship. So they did not have to apply to become citizens, they were automatically granted that citizenship in 1924. Okay, whew, 
that was a lot of uh, history there, and I've kind of glossed over just giving you the highlights. There's a lot more depth there that I could have gone into, but I just, just tonight, I want to give you the basics to get you started. Now, how do we go about researching these U.S. statutes? So I mentioned before that I gave you the, the in each of those statutes that we discussed in, in the first page of your handout, I also have those listed along the, with the highlights. And in parentheses at the, at the heading of each one of those is the citation to how you find that statute. So, um, so you're gonna go to, this is in your handout, the statutes at large. Okay, this is in the resources part at the end of your handout. If you want to go research the individual, you know, read what the actual law is, you can do that by going to U.S. Statutes at Large. And there is a browse link there when you get to that page. So I'm going to show you how to look for that first statute we talked about, which is 1 Stat 103. Okay, so 1... The first number, the 1, refers to the volume, and then the 103 refers to the page in that volume. So when I click on that link for the statutes at large, you click the browse button, browse link that I showed you a second ago, and then you come to this page. And now you see there's all these volumes, 1 through 18. These only go up to 1875, but there are other links that will take you to later ones. But right now we're just trying to find that volume 1. So we go to, we look for volume 1, which is the first one there. And then what you want to do is you want to click on that link that says list of public acts. When you click on that, you go to a book that is all of volume 1 which are all of those acts encompassed in volume one. And then there's a, a item at the top of the page there that says turn to image. And you're gonna, in that box there where the number is, you're gonna type in 103. Remember where we're looking for one stat 103. So you put in 103 and you can hit enter. And then it's going to take you to page 103 of volume one. And there we will find the full um, the full wording for that statute. Okay, so this is the one, this is that first uh, naturalization law that was instituted in 1790. And then they have notes in the margin too that are helpful. You can see there on the right-hand side, uh, it tells you what the statute is, what the date was, but then it also says that it was repealed uh, in 1795 and they have other um, notes in there. So you can read all those little notes that can help you find later later statutes that apply to the same to the current statute that you're reading about. And then you can hit next page and continue to read all of it. Okay. So there's the um, there's your next page next image and you just you can just keep reading for as long as that law goes on or for as much as you want to read. Uh, it's kind of fun just to read these statutes for any laws that you might be wanting to research. And then you can go back and forth to the previous image as well. So that's how the U.S. statutes at large, the online version, uh, works, and you can go research those statutes. Now I'm going to talk a second here about collective citizenship after I get a sip of water. So this citizenship is not documented, meaning when, um, when a group of people are collect collectively become citizens, uh, there's there's a law that's passed usually or something or some other act that is taking place where uh, a group of people become citizens and they are not individually named. So if you have ancestors who are part of these collective citizenships, you will not find uh, documentation of them as individuals becoming citizens. So the first one was this adoption of the U.S. Constitution in 1789, where anybody who was living in the United States at that point in time automatically became a citizen. Okay, so you're not going to find anybody, any of your ancestors who were living here uh, before 1789, they automatically became citizens when the Constitution was adopted. Uh, if, if you have ancestors who lived in the, in the area of the Louisiana Purchase, all of those people became citizens in 1803 when that purchase took place. 
Similarly, we have the acquisition of Florida in 1819, the Republic of Texas in 1845, the Oregon Territory in 1846, um, the cession of Mexican territory and California in 1848, uh, the Gadsden Purchase, which was uh, New Mexico and Arizona in 1854, Hawaiian Territory in 1900, Puerto Rico in 1917. So those, those people are not individually named when they became citizens. All right, so I'm hoping that somebody here in the audience had an ancestor who arrived between 1798 and 1828. I unfortunately do not, but uh, but I would encourage you that if you do have somebody that showed up during this time that you go look for those alien registrations. So the clerks of court during that time were supposed to document the following details. They were supposed to list the applicant's name, their date of birth, their age, their nation of allegiance, the country of emigration, their place of intended settlement. Now, these are mainly found in East Coast states, and of course, that's because in that time frame, uh, there were that's where the bulk of our immigration was coming from. But um, you know, you can find them. I think there are some for San Francisco as well. So um, here is uh, some places where you can find these alien. Uh, registrations. So the Federal District Court of Pennsylvania have the Pennsylvania Landing Reports of Aliens. Uh, it has an FHL number. So you can go to the uh, to the Family History Library catalog and put in a place name like Pennsylvania and you'll find these. Or you can use these FHL numbers as well. Um, Maryland has a list of alien and registrations. Boston um, you can search for the author. Now I'm talking about going to the Family Search catalog, and you can search for the author being United States District Court and find some, or the author being United States Circuit Court, and look for these alien registrations. Remember, they're only um, they're only being registered between 1798 and 1828. And then there are individual counties or states too that may have these registrations during that time frame. Now here's an alien report. I just randomly picked this. He's not one of my ancestors or anything, but this is an alien report of Michael Duponso. I hope I'm pronouncing his name correctly, from 1803, and he arrived at, at Pennsylvania. And uh, I know you can't read this, but basically the, the details in this document show that it was filed on December 2nd, 1803. Uh, this man was born in St. Martin on the Isle of Ré in France, and that gives his exact birth date. He owed allegiance to the French Republic. He arrived at Baltimore on June 26, 1803. He intends to settle in Pennsylvania. Um, before the French Revolution, he was an heir to French nobility and bore the title of Chevalier. And he was invested with the Royal and Military Order of St. Louis and it has his signature, okay? So imagine if you can find this for your own ancestor. So I hope some of you are able to find one of these tonight. All right, naturalization records pre-1906. So let's talk about what kind of documents are being created before 1906. So the following processes created records. We just talked about the registry of aliens, okay, which really isn't naturalization, but it's more about immigration. But still, I, I want you guys to be aware of that. And so that was from 1798 to 1828 that aliens were being registered automatically or should have been. Uh, the declaration of intention, if you have somebody naturalizing starting in 1795 and later, there was a declaration of intention, which should have been filed uh, in most cases, right? We've talked about some of the exceptions already. Uh, then the next step would have been the petition for naturalization. And there's usually a two to three year time period between the declaration of intention and the petition for naturalization. That was a minimum time period. Uh, they could have, before 1906, I don't know of any instances where that declaration of intention expired. Okay, so I think, you know, it could have been 10 years between the time that somebody filed that declaration of intention and the time that they became a naturalized citizen. Um, 
and then there was a court order that granted citizenship. Sometimes that court order is just documented right, al right along with the petition, or sometimes you see it in court minute books, that sort of thing. And then finally, a certificate of naturalization was given to the person. So you may find a certificate of naturalization in your own uh, ancestors' papers. Hopefully something like that might have survived. Uh, I have a, a declaration of intention, a copy that was in my great-great-grandfather's papers. I don't know that he ever became um, a full U.S. citizen. He filed his declaration of intention, and then that was all she wrote, I think. Okay, so, um, so these records, like I said before, could have been filed in any court of law. So they could be at a federal court. They could have been at a state court. They could have been at a local court. And when I say a local court, that could have been a county court, a municipal court, a city court, et cetera. So any one of those levels of jurisdictions, any one of those types of courts could have been a place where your ancestor uh, naturalized. Now, the other thing that's tricky is they can file their declaration of intention in one court. Maybe they moved across the country before they became a full citizen, so their final papers could be re could be uh, submitted in a different court. Okay, so so to you always want to see if you can find both documents, unless your ancestor was in one of those exception categories where they only had to file uh, the naturalization and not the declaration of intention. Uh, so so be be aware of that. You need to look uh, in all of the courts and find both documents. Uh, the forms were designed and created locally, so every court had their own system, their, ho their own forms for these, uh, for these records. And so some, some were very, uh, the information uh, varied greatly, so some were very detailed and some were not detailed at all, like barely asking the name and maybe not even the age of the person, okay? So, uh, but don't just assume that you, that the document is not going to have any information in it because you just never know what's going to be there. So for example, Adams County, Illinois, where I, I grew up in Adams County in Quincy, Illinois, and during a brief time period in the 1840s, the declarations of intention were very, very detailed. Uh, during that time. So they would ask for the person's date of birth and what when they when they left the old country, when they arrived in the new country, what ship they were traveling on. Very detailed. But then they stopped doing that. I don't know why they stopped doing that, but just just be aware to look for and not assume that they are not going to have much information. The other thing is that a lot of times people assume that the declaration of intention is going to have more detail and oftentimes more often than not, that is true, that the Declaration of Intention has more detail than the final paper or the, nat the petition for naturalization. Okay, so, but look for both because you just don't know what the courts, what the individual courts were requiring at the time. Now, here's an example of one from the, um, the Court of Cook, the Superior Court of Cook County. Okay, so this was uh, in 1893. So we see here, this is a declaration of intention. This is the first step that this man was taking to become a United States citizen. And the word we're looking for is it's bona fide his intention. So this is a declaration of intention. Uh, you don't see that word intention in, in the naturalization document. So this was the first step. Here's another example of one. This is from 1853, I believe. And this is where Henry Steinkamp, this is in, um, in Hamilton County, Ohio, so Cincinnati. Uh, he was filing his declaration of intention. Of course, it says that in bold letters across the top that this is a declaration of intention. But also within the verbiage, we have this word bona fide his intention. So I'm sorry, this is 1851, not 1853. So this is his, his, the first step of the naturalization process. Now there are several terms that you're gonna hear and it could get kind of confusing um, for that final document. So some, sometimes you'll hear it referred to as the petition for naturalization. Uh, it could be called the final papers or the second papers. It could be called a final oath. And usually there is an oath in there where the person is, is swearing allegiance to their new country and, um, 
and saying that they were no longer uh, swearing allegiance to to their old, you know, to the emperor of Germany or whoever whoever it was that that was in charge of the country where they were leaving. Okay. So here is um, this is another. The, now this is a um, testimony that's being given by a person. So sometimes you can find these testimonies. Um, this is given by a person who knew Leo Zadelsky for at least five years. Um, this was filed with his naturalization in the criminal court of Cook County. Okay, so his declaration of intention was filed in 1893. That was the first one we saw, and that was in the superior court. Now this is in the criminal court of Cook County, still Cook County. Uh, so this is his, um, this is somebody giving testimony that they know this man, he's got, he's of good character, they've known him for at least five years, and that he should be, become a citizen of the United States. And then finally here we have the final paper or the petition for naturalization. This is his, um, his final oath here for Leo Zetel Zedelsky. So same day as, as, the, um, as, the, as the affidavit was, was filed, again, in the criminal court, because all of this is happening all in the same place in 1896. Okay, so that's what some of these documents might look like. Now, yours that you find may look very different from these, but this is the basic information. Not a lot of personal information in these documents. Uh, this is in Cook County. Now, after 1906, let's talk about what happens after 1906. Now, let's talk about, first of all, the genealogy of the Immigration and Naturalization Service. So in 1906, we had the Bureau of Immigration and Naturalization, and it was part of the Department of Commerce and Labor. So this organization was taking over all of the naturalization in the United States. Okay, it could still be filed in local courts, but everything was going to be folded in at the federal level. So copies were going to be sent to the federal government. In 1930, in, in 1913, we have the Bureau of Naturalization, which was separated from the Bureau of Immigration. And uh, the Bureau of Naturalization was under the Department of Labor. Then in 1933, we actually have the um, INS, the Immigration and Naturalization Service. Um, that was under the Department of Labor up until 1940 when it was when it was transferred to the Department of Justice. And then in 2003, we uh, the USCIS, the United States Citizen and Immigration Service was created. So the INS went away at that time. And that is under the Department of Homeland Security. And that's where it is today. So what kind of records are being created after 1906? Well, the first one is a certificate of arrival. And the certificate of arrival basically is um, the people who are processing the declaration of intention, they first go and they look at the passenger lists and they attempt to certify uh, when that person actually came into the country, that they were arriving legally, and they create this form, the certificate of arrival. Uh, then there's the declaration of intention, just like before, they had a file, um, a paper, that says they're, they're intending to become a citizen of the United States. Now, after 1906, this declaration of intention does expire after seven years. Okay, so they had to have completed the process within seven years or else they'd have to start the process all over again. And then the once uh, two or three, two years had gone by, uh, the petition for naturalization could be filed. And then um, they were given a certificate of, of citizenship at the time that they applied, that they submitted their petition. Um, and also from 1906 to 1956, we have certificate files, which were also called C files. So basically any of the, any of the documents that were created in the process of becoming a citizen after 1906 were created you know, in this file for one person. All right, so you, you might be able to find C files. In 1944, they started um, creating alien files. So there's a lot of depth here. Um, I would encourage you, if you want to get into all of the details of this, to read the docu read the books that I have in, the, uh, in your syllabus 
Uh, there are a couple of really good ones by John Newman. So I would encourage you to, you know, to get your hands on those. Your local libraries, um, I can't name all of the libraries that might have them, but look at your local library to see if those books are available. Uh, I was able to buy one of them more recently. I don't know, they, I think they're out of copyright, or out of, not out of copyright, out of print currently, but, you know, take a look to see if you're really getting into all the nitty-gritty details of naturalization. You want to get your hands on one of those books. They are excellent. So uh, how do you find these naturalization records? Well, let's talk about that. So this a naturalization document is not the first thing that you're going to try to find for your ancestor because you want to know a lot about their lives and you want to have kind of a framework of who they were as a person, when they arrived, how old they were, where they came from, and the places that they lived. So, uh, you know, by knowing their approximate birth and death dates, that gives you a window of time uh, or in, in their immigration date, if, if possible, it gives you a window of time for knowing when they could have naturalized, right? They're not going to naturalize after they passed away. Um, find them in every single census for, for the time that they were living in the United States. So uh, those censuses can provide clues to where they lived, obviously, uh, to to dates when they arrived. Uh, some of the censuses actually ask, you know, how long were, have you been in the country? When did you arrive in the country? Um, sometimes some of the censuses, the later ones after 1900, will ask about their naturalization process, their naturalization status. Did they file, have they filed first papers? Have they come, are, are they full US citizens? Uh, and I think a lot of times too, uh, I have found that that information is a little misleading sometimes because I think sometimes uh, maybe maybe people didn't uh, understand the question because I think even then naturalization was maybe a little complicated for them to understand or maybe they just wanted to be citizens and so yeah, I'm a citizen. So uh, just kind of take it with a grain of salt, but it can give you some clues if the, if the census you're looking at have something pertaining to their naturalization status. Voter registration records, if you can get a hold of those, if they're available for you, uh, there are some for uh, like three different years in Cook County that are online. And those are those will tell you when that person became a citizen and where they naturalized. And so that can be very helpful to finding naturalization records, if you can find voter registration records. And know the county and state formation dates because if your ancestor lived in a certain area and it was it may have been a different county than what it is right now. So you want to look under the old county and the new county when you're looking for naturalization records for that for your ancestor. Okay. So now these passenger lists, now this is um this is a passenger list from 1912. This is the President Lincoln ship that sailed from Hamburg to New York. And that's really not that important where it came from or anything, but this is an example of a later post-1906 passenger list. So if your ancestor came into the country after 1906, these passenger lists are very detailed. And you see it looks, they, they, they kind of look like a hot mess, right? Because they've got scribbles all over the place. But these scribbles can be very important and very helpful to you. So the first thing I just want to point out, here we have somebody's name that's lined out. Okay, what could that mean? Well, that lined out may mean that they never boarded the ship. They could have bought a ticket and their name got put on the ship or on the, on the passenger list, but then they never actually sailed. That's one reason their name could be lined out. It could also be lined out because maybe they were they were entered twice on that passenger list. So uh, so it doesn't necessarily mean they didn't get on the ship. They could just be enumerated twice on there. So that's one, that's another reason it could be lined out. Now, excuse me. Now the, the next thing that's interesting is in the occupation column. You may see notations like this. And if you see this for your ancestor, this is information about when they naturalized. This is an indication that they did naturalize, or at least they started the process. So this particular uh, number here is um, the number of the certificate of arrival. So remember I said when they started after 1906, when they started the naturalization process, um, the clerks who were processing that had to find 
go back to the passenger list and create the certificate of arrival using the information on the passenger list. So when they did that, when they found the person who was coming forward to say they, they want to file a declaration of intention, they would go on this passenger list, find the person, and then add this notation, which is the certificate of arrival number, and then there's a date there. And so you can see it's, it's May um, something of 1936, okay? So that's, that's a rough idea of when they started the naturalization process. Now, the interesting thing about this is um, they began creating these certificates of arrival in 1906, okay? But it wasn't until 1926 that the, um, that the clerks began to make these notations. So if you have somebody who naturalized between 1906 and 1926, you're not going to see these, um, these notations on their passenger list. The, um, the passenger lists themselves were actually microfilmed by the National Archives in about 1942-1943. When you're looking at Ancestry.com or Family Search, you're looking at natural, you know, stuff that's been digitized from the National Archives microfilms. Okay, so those were create those were originally created in 1942-1943. So if your ancestor naturalized after that, after 1942 or 1943, again, you're not going to see the notations on there because they were already filmed. Okay, so hopefully that helps a little bit. Or maybe it just confuses you. I don't know. I'll take questions on that. <laughs> um, OK, so if we want to look for naturalization records, now this is uh, Ancestry.com. And if you want to go to the search, oh, actually, first I'm going to show you the um, voters registration. So this is for Chicago. But if you have a, a different area that you're looking for, search around for voter registration records. You can go to, you can search for them on Ancestry, go to Family Search, and, and go to put in your place name for the place that you're researching, and look and see if there are uh, voter registration records that have been microfilmed by the Family History Library. Uh, you can also look at your local library, contact uh, local historical societies, and that sort of thing for the area that you're researching. But right now, I'm going to show you what is available for Chicago. So uh, if you hit search, and then in the keyword section, um, for the I, I selected search and then card catalog on Ancestry. And then in the keyword, you put in Chicago voter. And then you hit enter. And these three uh, entries come up, these three databases. And you can click on each one of these and search those databases for your ancestor's name. OK, and then when you get to that, you will see columns that will ask if you find your ancestor in there. It'll ask how long they've been in the city, what their address is, and, and it'll also ask when and where they naturalized. So it'll have the date that they naturalized, and it'll have the place and the court where they naturalized. So if you have somebody that naturalized somewhere outside of Chicago, but they were registered to vote in Chicago, you can find where they naturalized by using these voters registration lists. Um, know what courts in the area that you're researching, know what courts naturalized. So you can use research guides for that county or state. If you, if you have a research guide that was published for the area that you're researching, make sure you're reading that and getting any information. You can go to the Family Search Wiki, which is great for finding articles about researching in your area. So those are just two ideas on how to find what courts were available in the time, in the place where you're researching during the time frame that your ancestor lived there. And know all the places where your ancestor lived so, so that you can, you know, if they might have been in one place when they filed their declaration of intention and then in another place when they fi filed their final papers. So keep that in mind as well. So there's a lot of moving pieces to naturalization research. So if you want to find records that are available at Family Search, you go to the Family Search catalog. So on Ancestry, you went to the card catalog and you can look for naturalization records. And I'll show you another example with Ancestry in a minute. If you're going to the Family Search, you can go to the catalog. The default when you when you click catalog 
it defaults to asking you what the place name is. So in that case, you put in the county level, put in the name of the city where you're researching, put in the name of the state, look at each one of those for the area that you're researching um, and look to see what they have for naturalization records. So search for each level of jurisdiction for each place where your ancestor lived and do that for all of the towns where you're researching. So here is um, the search button on the Family Search main page. And then I clicked Catalog to get here. Here is that place search. And then that's where you would put in your county, your town, your state, put all three of them in, you know, one after another and see which ones have naturalization records listed. So in this case, I put in um, Adams County, which I mentioned is where I'm from. And all of these, um, you get a listing of all these different um, items here on the right hand side. So scroll through that, it's all alphabetical by type of record. Um, scroll through that until you find N for naturalization. So I'm going to scroll down to get to the ends. And I see that that top item there is naturalization and citizenship. You click on that, it opens up more detail. And there you can see that there are certain types of, there's naturalization and related records for different time frames or circuit court records. Um, there's one, you see the author of that first item is the Great River Genealogical Society. Uh, I usually try to go first for the original records. So the nothing against the Great River Genealogical Society. They did a great job of compiling all that, but a lot of times those you cannot read online. Maybe they, are, uh, they haven't been digitized, although more and more they are being digitized now by Family Search. But that might be something that you can only get at the library. Uh, whereas the circuit court records are the ones that were created by the actual courts. You can see that like the second item there, the, the author is the Illinois Circuit Court in Adams County. Those are original records. Uh, so let's go ahead and click on, um, let's see, we're going to click on, there's naturalization and indexes, but I'm going to click on the circuit court records. And when I do that, I see that there's this camera on the right hand side. There's no key at the top. Sometimes you'll see that camera with a key, which means that you they are locked um, from you viewing them at, at wherever you are. But uh, here the camera is wide open, so I can just look at these at home. And when I click on that camera, it pulls up all of the images that in the old days would have been on microfilm, uh, which are now digitized. And you can you know, hit the next image or you can go back and forth um, by clicking on this. Um, you, can, you can jump to an image by typing a number into that image number, or you can hit those arrows to go forward and backward to, to peruse these page by page. OK, um, so I'm going to click on this image right here, and I see that that's an index. So it's an alphabetical listing. So those first several pages of this of this set is a handwritten index, essentially. So you look in there and find, you know, whatever letter of the alphabet you're interested in and then find your name. And if your name is there, then it'll tell you what page to go to. And then you can kind of guess where that page might be in this book and then go to that image. So hopefully that makes sense. Um, you can expand the on the left hand side there. There's a plus and minus button, which enlarge and um, reduce the image size. So you can you should be able to see this um, just fine. I know it's not easily visible right here, um, but I, I just wanted to show you how to do that. OK, if we want to do this naturalization research at Ancestry, what I'm going to do, so, so you can go into, um, uh, you can go to, to browse, like one way to browse is to go hit search, and then you scroll down and you find there's a map. And you can go down to that map and click on whatever state you're researching and go there and see um, a listing of all the different records that they have for that state. But right now I'm going to show you how, if you're doing some research in Cook County, I'm going to show you a very important uh, record set for naturalization records if you're doing Cook County research. So um, if you go to search, and in this case, we're going to go to immigration and travel because that's where the naturalization records are categorized. There's many ways to, to find the records on Ancestry. But 
in this case, we're going to the immigration and travel. Uh, and then you're going to look for on the, you're going to narrow it by category. And in this case, we're going to narrow it by citizenship and naturalization records. Okay. And um, another thing we could have done, I do know that this, uh, that there is an important Cook County um, index here that's under the U.S. naturalization record indexes. So I went, so another way to do this is to go to the card catalog, okay, and then put in the name of the database that you're looking for. And in this case, I do know the name of my database. So it's U.S. naturalization record indexes. Um, then you click on that. So one database comes up that's here on the, on the right-hand side, okay, and you click on that. And now you can search here if you want. You can search by last name, but sometimes um, the names don't come up because maybe they're hard to see on the original image. So what I like to do if I can't find the name is I will browse the collection. And so you, to browse the collection on the right-hand side, you go in there. I'm just blowing up what's on the right-hand side here so you can see it. And you start by choosing your state. So you click that box. And you can see here there's this one collection that covers parts of Illinois, Indiana, Wisconsin, Iowa. And it, it covers Chicago. But with, if you're doing Chicago and Cook County research, this particular data set covers the the county courts in Cook County as well as the federal courts that were in Chicago. So if you have somebody that was in Chicago and you have no idea which one of the many courts in the Chicago area they might have gone to, this collection uh, should have it indexed for you. So click that, that uh, first state where you got all those states together and then you hit choose and then it's going to open up. Now this is where it gets a little bit tricky. This is organized by Soundex code. So you need to figure out there are online Soundex calculators and maybe you already know off the top of your head what your answer, what your, uh, the Soundex code is for your last name. So figure out what that code is. And then once you know the Soundex code, then you can go through here and find that, that Soundex code, that number range, and then click on one of those, um, items. Now here we're in um, A536 through A651. And basically here is a card. This is a, a card, an index card for each person that was naturalized in this general region, that Illinois, Indiana, Wisconsin um, region. And then the, it tells you where they naturalized. And then you can go find those naturalization records uh, by looking at this index card. And it tells you the date. Sometimes it tells you uh, who witnessed the, the immigration. But you don't. if you find your ancestor in this collection, you don't want to just stop with that and, and just use that card. You want to go get that actual naturalization document because it could add more detail from what is on the card. And it should add more detail than what is on the card. OK, let me know if you have questions about that. All right, so now um, I talked briefly about the C files that were created from 1906 to 1956. If you're trying to get a hold of the C files, um, you can go to the, to the USCIS. Um, they require that you submit an index search uh, and that's $65. So this is very pricey. And then there's a record search that once they get, once they come back to you with the index search, then you can submit a record search for another $65. So this is very pricey. And I, I don't know that you're necessarily going to find a lot of detail. Okay. Uh, I've heard of people doing this and then they only get one or two pages of information, which is possibly not worth it. But if you're absolutely stuck and you've looked at other, you know, you've contact, you've looked at all the other places where you can find, you know, think of to find naturalization records, I would, I would talk to a National Archives archivist if you're doing this research after 1906. Um, don't just automatically go spend this money. Okay, it is a lot of money. But if you've, if it's, if you think it, it's, you know, if it's like the last resort, 
this might be helpful. So I'm putting it out there, not necessarily recommending that you go this route, but it's a thought. Now, um, alien files were created from 1943 forward, and they were, so the A files were again like this compilation of uh, records that, uh, that pertain to somebody becoming a citizen after 1943, obviously. So A, so a files for people born more than 100 years ago, most are at the Kansas City National Archives for anywhere in the United States. Um, and others are at San Francisco for the INS district offices that were in San Francisco, Honolulu, Reno, and Guam. And then old A files, those that are numbered under 8 million may also be ordered from the USCIS. Okay, so those are, if you're looking, if you're researching in this later time period, which um, I have not honestly done a lot of research in this later time period, but uh, look into that if you are looking, if you're, um, you know, try to go to the, to the Kansas City National Archives first and see what you can, if you can get uh, what you need there. Okay, so if you're not finding what you need, you've looked at family search, you've looked on Ancestry, um, and those aren't the only uh, to websites on the block. There's um, other websites as well that may find it. Talk to the local genealogical societies, okay? Um, if you can't, you know, call county courthouses and find out where their archives are for, for naturalization records. They may still have them in the courthouse. They may have been moved off-site somewhere. They might, might have been moved to a state archive. But just get on the phone and start calling if you're not finding what you need. Because a lot of times they just are not online call the city court offices, um, contact the National Archives, if, um, you know, especially if it's after 1906. Before 1906, then, then, you know, focus on those first two, contacting county court offices or city court offices, okay? Um, now I'm going to talk a little bit about more anomalies and tidbits, just little things to know as you get into more details on naturalization. Um, we've talked about derivative citizenship. Uh, derivative citizenship is where a person derives their citizenship from someone else. So minor children, for example, when a minor child's uh, parent became a citizen, usually it was the father, um, when that, be that man or woman became a citizen, the minor children, those under the age of 21, automatically became citizens. So, and, and in that time period before 1906, the people who got derivative citizenship were not named typically in any document. So it's just man naturalizes, and then the assumption is that any of his minor children uh, who were alive at that point in time became citizens. Any of his children born after that fact were citizens. Uh, widows and minor children of an alien who filed a declaration, we talked about that already. Um, so if an alien filed a declaration of intention, his widow and his minor children who were left uh, could become citizens, citizens once they created that final oath. Um, the wife of a person who became a citizen automatically acquired citizenship in 1855 and forward. But there was no documentation, again, of her name once he became a citizen. Her name is not going to be named until we get to 1906. Once you get to 1906, then the children and the uh, wife and everybody are very carefully documented with their dates of birth and places of birth and everything, very detailed after 1906. So um, now between 1907 and 1922, I mentioned this earlier, in 1907, there was a law that was passed that a female citizen, so a woman born in the United States, if she married an alien, meaning a man who's not yet a citizen, she would lose her citizenship. In 1922, they repealed that law. So women who married after 19, who, you know, citizen women who married aliens after 1922 no longer lost their citizenship. However, um, in 1922, those who had lost their citizenship before were not automatically reinstated. And then after that, these women had to go through a naturalization uh, process. Now in, in um, let's see, I got a 
few more details here. Women had to file a, a petition for naturalization and take an oath of allegiance that was from 1922 to 1936. So, um, so she didn't have to file a declaration of intention from 1922 to 1936. In 1936, a law allowed women to reinstate her citizenship if the marriage had ended. Um, in 1940, all women who had lost citizenship between 1907 and 1922 could reinstate their citizenship regardless of marital status by taking an oath of allegiance, okay? So a lot of little details there. You can see how this gets very nuanced as you get into more, um, more research on it. Now, uh, we have the minor naturalization. So alien minors who arrived with their parents, um, so they were minors when they arrived, they could be naturalized without filing a declaration of intention, provided that they, they were at least three years of, um, that they had arrived at least three years before reaching the age of 21. They had lived in the United States at least five years. And once they reached the age of 21, they could, they could apply for citizenship without the declaration of intention. This law was repealed in 1906. But when you're, when you're doing naturalization research, if you find a naturalization record, that final paper for one of your ancestors, and it says minor naturalization across the top, this is what they're talking about. That's why it says minor naturalization. You're not going to find a declaration of intention. And again, that's before 1906. Then we've got alien veterans. We talked a little bit about these guys already. In 1862, there was a law that allowed honorably discharged veterans to become citizens once they um, filed once they filed for citizenship, once they, they filed those final papers, they did not have to file um, a declaration of intention. And then there were later laws that, that gave similar privileges to veterans of other wars. Obviously, this first one was, was uh, mainly pertaining to uh, Civil War veterans and, and the earlier wars. Uh, so here is an example too. Now this is where um, the, the answers aren't necessarily obvious when you're looking at it. This is Frank Cusack. This was given to me by a friend. And this man uh, became naturalized. And it says when they, when they were looking for his certificate of arrival, apparently they didn't find it. And uh, it says that he arrived under the name of another whose name I can't remember. <laughs> But then it had the name of the vessel where he arrived. Um, so, so how how would this you know did this person become naturalized? How were they allowed in? This is in 1940. Um, sounds a little fishy, right? But in 1943, Frank Cusack did indeed uh, become a citizen of the United States. So, um, some possible solutions to this. Um, you may be able to find uh, information about this in the registry files from that were um, available from 1929 to 1944. Um, there was there were arrival records for aliens who arrived after or who arrived before July of 1924 for whom no arrival record could be found because you can imagine that you know some of these passenger lists got destroyed and that sort of thing. So sometimes it just wasn't possible to create that certificate of arrival that was required after um, 1906. So these were also known as the lawful entry files. So these cop copies of, if you're looking to get some of these files, look and see if, if you can get those through the USCIS uh, genealogy records. So those are just, you know, some examples of some of the things you, you might encounter. I hope you have found this helpful. I know there's a lot of information here and we've just barely scratched the surface, but I hope you have um, the means that you need to get going to start researching uh, your ancestors' potential naturalization records. So happy hunting and I will take questions. And of course, I can tell you for certainty, there are questions. That's good. It always worries me when there aren't questions. I'm like, oh. <laughs> that will never happen with our group here. <laughs> I can promise you that. Um, so for everybody that's listening right now, I'm going to start going over the questions I've received so far. I know there's going to be more questions coming in, so I will get back to that in the chat box as well as any that are going in the Q&A, but at least I can start with what we've had so far. Um, 
This is from Karen. Her great grandfather, Vaclav Janda, was naturalized in 1893. He married her, uh, Karen's grand, great grandmother, shortly after. She would have been naturalized at that point. Vaclav passed away in 1902. Did the great grandmother maintain her naturalized status? Yes, she should have maintained her naturalized status. See, I start you with easy ones. <laughs> All right, let's get going more. At least if there's an exception to that, maybe I don't know it, but no, I don't. She would have, she would have maintained it. I mean, I think I, for my guessing, I would say the same thing, although I think it's a pretty good educated guess for that. Uh, from James, uh, any comments on what records or procedures might exist for Irish coming through Boston in the 1850 to 1855 time frame? What kind of records besides, well, I mean, you would have your passenger arrival lists, um, Although, you know, not, they don't all exist. Some, some estimate that only about 80% exist. And then if, you know, they may have become citizens, so you might have that available to you. Um, I don't specialize in Irish research, but I do know, um, what was it? There's, there's some publication, the Irish Friends. Help me out here. Is that the um, thing where, where they publish something in a newspaper? Yeah, where they're the trying to out? connect with other yeah, family members. I, I don't know the formal name of it, but I thought that that was a process that people publish something in those Boston newspapers. Yeah, so but depending on where they arrived to and where they were living. Uh, I'm not sure that I'm answering the question, but those are some of the things. And obviously, you'd want to do all of the other types of research on your Irish ancestors, just like any other uh, ancestor. You know, make sure you can find them in the in the census, if the state where they were living was doing census, was maintaining censuses, find the state censuses as well. James, Hopefully I answered your question. I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah, James, if we need to revisit that or you want to chat with other clarifications, we can come back to it. Uh, this is a question from A, just the letter A. Uh, okay. And this, Hi, was, a. this was early on in your slides, I think, because she was referring to the slide you had um, sim around the time period of the March 1804 statute. Okay. I think she followed up with something that here's her, her question. Uh, the 1798 naturalization statute. Did you say that there were no manifest lists before that time period? Well, no manifest list is a, a kind of a touchy one. I mean, there were, there were, let's just say the the federal government was not requiring that uh, passenger list be maintained until 1820. And at that point, there was a law passed that every port of entry had to have a passenger list submitted for every ship that came into port. Before that time, you may find um, that that individuals maintained lists. You may find book compilations of, of passenger lists, uh, but it's hit or miss as to whether those passenger lists survived or were even created. They just weren't required before 1820. Okay. Uh, another question from A, are the alien reports in family search indexed? I think it depends on, um, I think it depends on the alien reports. It's not indexed. Let me say this. The last I checked, they were not like indexed where you could just put in a name into a search box on family search, if that makes sense. But uh, like those microfilm numbers, uh, the last I checked were digitized and you could probably go into those uh books and look at the digital books and there may be a handwritten index at the beginning or at the end of those books and look through them that way. Okay. I think I'm saying the right thing there. I'm, I believe there are handwritten indexes at least. Okay. Uh, also another question from A, this is around the 1900s time period. Is there a reason that many of the certificates of arrivals are not found with the declaration and other papers. Around 1900? 
Yeah, or in the nineteen so, hundreds. Oh, in the nineteen hundreds. Um, well, if it's if it's before nineteen oh six, you know, there the, it wasn't required. Um, if it's after nineteen oh six, then uh, they should be. But sometimes, you know, I just can't comment on record keeping and <laughs> how you know. I'm sure it kind of depended on on what office it was coming from, and and I could imagine that pieces of paper got lost along the way, but, and then I, and I think that became better as time went on, but I've certainly seen uh, files or, or um, papers where not all of those documents are there. So, okay. People try to be perfect, but they're just not. Okay. This is a question from Don. Is there a specific form for certificate of arrival? Yes. Yeah. There was a, and that form probably changed, but yeah, you you should see that there was actually a form. It would say certificate of arrival on it, and then it's it's usually just maybe a half a page long, and it would just have the person's name on it and probably the ship and the date when they arrived, and and I'm not sure what else, but yeah. Okay, this is more a comment for me at the point that you were talking about the pre 1906 naturalization information. Mm -hmm. um, I know for me personally. Uh, my own great, my own grandfather, um, on his, even if there was not very much genealogical information, at least I found that that was a place to be able to get his signature. Yeah. And also the signature of the witness, there was a witness signature. Mm -hmm. And more than likely that witness signature was in some way related to or a neighbor to or a friend yeah. to my grandfather. So the signature of the witness can also add a little bit more of, you know, possibly, re you know, researching some connections there. Right. Part of the fan club. Mm -hmm. So that was, I know that was good for me. Mm -hmm. uh, also from A, is there a state by state listing of what courts are available that would be related to the naturalization process? I don't know of a state by state listing. So the thing I would do is I would recommend that you either get a you look for research guides uh, for the state that you're, you know, hopefully there's a research guide for the state that you're researching in. Um, again, research guides for the county. Uh, go to the, you know, some of the some of the online, um, like I'm trying to think what database or what uh, website it was, but there was a, a county court or maybe it was state level and they and I saw one where they had a whole history of all of the different courts that had been in that state. But I don't know of like one central place where every state is listed. Um, and I would love it if somebody out there does know of one. <laughs> that would be great. But no, I don't know of one. Maybe I can even help with that. When the question actually came up, I did a quick look Okay. I don't, I don't know if it gave the complete answer to it, but I ultimately wound up going to the family search wiki. Okay. And in the family search wiki, the wiki entry that I looked at that looked promising for possibly this, it was called the United States naturalization and citizenship is what the wiki entry is. Okay. Um, so anyhow, if, I, if this pans out, I did see in there that there were two links and they were titled this United States. Uh, let's see. Uh, they were titled this United States district court jurisdictions. That was one. Okay. And then another link within this wiki entry said the directory of courts having jurisdictions in naturalization proceedings. Hmm. That okay. one sounds good. Yeah, that one does. I think uh, the only and that might be exactly what we need. Um, sometimes they direct you to like modern jurisdictions. So just be sure it's historical and not modern. So, so what I'm going to do is at least as I do a little bit more digging over the next few days, I'll include that wiki entry link in the follow-up email I'll send. And it'll also give me a time to look at some of the entries, the links that were in that entry to see if that, the one about the court systems for naturalization is actually meaningful. So I'll take okay. a look at that. That sounds um, good. Here's a question from Karen. 
what might notations mean on passenger lists before 1906? What might those uh, things indicate? Well, before 1906, first of all, you've probably got a much different form that you're looking at. So I don't know that you would uh, find the, I mean, I, I don't know that you would be finding the same type of notations on a pre-1906 passenger list, but but they could, I mean, if you're seeing something in an occupation column that looks kind of like it could be a certificate of arrival number or if it has a date like that, I mean, I guess it could be something like that. Um, there could be any number of reasons that those earlier notations might be um, made. There is an excellent, and I think it's in your syllabus. I don't have it in front of me. I forgot to print it out. Um, there is a the Jewish Gen uh, genealogy website, they have an excellent article on all these notations that are on passenger lists. So I would encourage you to, to, to look those up. But most of them pertain to these after 1906 uh, passenger lists. So I don't know the person that asked that question, do you have a certain passenger list before 1906 that's um, that has notations that you're wondering about? Yeah, and, what, and what notation might it be that you discovered? Yeah, send it to me, actually, because I'd okay. like to see it. All right, this is a question from Jane. Her grandparents arrived to New York in 1903. The grandfather filed the intention and was naturalized in 1906. Does that mean that her grandmother was automatically naturalized due to the 1855 law? Well, probably, because I think um, I don't I don't know that there was new verbiage in the 1906 law that would have changed that. But essentially, it's the same. You know, it's the same end result. So whether it's the 1855 one or the 1906 one, she would have become a citizen. Okay. And it depends on when. Um, so the one I think was June 1906. I don't know if the person uh, naturalized before June of 1906 or after. June of 1906? Right, because yeah. if it was before June, then it, it would have been under 1855. But but at the end of the day, she's still a citizen, whichever law it was. Okay. Um, here was sort of another comment from me during the time you were talking about, again, the, the court records and things like that. Um, again, I know that you, my familiarity is also with Cook County, Chicago records and stuff like that. But I found an amazing thing early on in my research when I was doing uh, hands-on research at the um, archivist of the Circuit Court of Cook County, Phil Costello's office. Mm -hmm. I'm telling you, I almost was floored there. The day that I was there and I was naive as naive could be about doing stuff then, they were pretty helpful uh, and this was at the Daily Center building in downtown Chicago. Uh -huh. They were very helpful. And it was it was so helpful that he actually, without me asking or knowing anything about the process, I told him the name of my grandfather or something. He walked away for, I don't know, five, 10 minutes. And he comes back to the desk area and he says, is this sort of what you're looking for? And he brings out the actual original naturalization oh. documents of my grandfather, not microfilmed, yep. not whatever, the actual ones. So sometimes you can have great luck with county governments that yeah. you think are bureaucracies that don't work. So, you know, it could happen to you in your own local county location. But to happen in the city of Chicago, in the county of Cook, yeah. was like a miracle beyond all miracles. Yeah. Well, and and so I, I do want to say on on that front, if you if you do go to that uh, Cook County Circuit Court archives, it's on the 13th floor at the at the Daly Center. Um, they have the if if somebody naturalized in a Cook County court, not one of the federal courts, but the Cook County courts, uh, they have all of those documents, the real deal, not on microfilm, yeah, <laughs> which they got a microfilm on soon, but, but you can, yeah, you can see those. Um, same with probate 
records. If you're doing Cook County probate research, you can go in there. They'll have to pull them off of offsite storage. But once they, you know, a couple, you'll have to go in there once and request them. And when you come back, they'll have them sitting there and it'll be the real documents. Okay. Pretty amazing. Here's a question from Gail. Could naturalization be initially denied and then later granted? And Gail provided some information about uh, her, I guess her, the card or something that she was looking at where it looks like there was something on one side that said, quote, other facts of record. Hmm. And yet on the, on the, the main side of the card, it was as if the person did get naturalized. Okay. So, I mean, there could be, there could have been some issue with maybe they're questioning how they got there. Maybe a certificate of arrival couldn't be found. You know, there could be any number of reasons. And this is one of those where um, if you're, you know, just try to try to figure out what those other documents might be. I don't know what year this was, but um, there's so many different nuances to things that could happen. Uh, maybe some reasons that they could have been rejected. I mean, maybe maybe they had a prison term recently or something. I have no idea. Or maybe they got them mixed up with somebody else with the same name. Um, there's so many, so many things that, that could happen. Right here. So I can get back to the regular chat messages that were coming in as I was going over ones that I recorded earlier. Uh, this is from D D I'm not sure when I read this, if this is enough detail here to really, I'm not sure what exactly, but I'll read it as you wrote it. Do you know what the date range is for paperwork, including photos? So I'm assuming that's for submission for naturalization. Yeah, I'm not sure what the, I mean, if we're talking about the date ranges for the, from the time that they file a declaration of intention to the time that they. Yeah, maybe D is their that final Because I know. I don't know about photo. And I'm not clear how the photos became part of that. Like they couldn't walk into Walgreens at that point, like your passport photo. <laughs> maybe they um, did it there. What was that? Yeah, maybe, maybe they, they did, did it, it there. there. I, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure because it's only the later ones that have have photos, but I assume those would have been taken at the time of the um, process. The you know they had a it, after 1906 there was a seven year time period from the time that you filed mm -hmm. a declaration of intention to the time that you filed your final papers. Before 1906 there wasn't that same time restraint. Um, the typical time frame, obviously, that declaration of intention space um, changed a little bit, but basically by, you know, the 1820s, it was a two-year time period between declaration okay. of intention and naturalization, but it could have been longer. Okay. D, I'm hoping the way that you wrote it and the way Teresa uh, acknowledged that, and I think part of that presentation, she did mention there was like a time limit. I'm hoping that that's what your question was. But if not, chat me back and we could clarify it more. Uh, this is from Joanne. Woman born in the U.S. married an alien in the early 1900s. If he was not naturalized when they divorced, would she lose her citizenship? Wow. Wait, so he was naturalized? Yeah, became... wo woman born in the U.S., married an alien in the early 1900s. Well, first of all, was it before 1907 or after 1907? Mm, okay. You know, so if it was before 1907, um, she would not have lost her citizenship. She would have retained it before 1907. Okay. Does and then it, they divorced it, and it, nothing changes. Do you think the divorce triggers anything? Or? I don't think so. Okay. So if she, but did he ever naturalize? Uh, no, the, the way she posed the question, Joanne said, if he was not naturalized when they divorced, would she lose her citizenship? Yeah, I'm questioning if she even lost it. You know, if it was before 1907, she didn't lose it. If it was after 1907, she lost it. They divorced. I don't think she would have automatically been reinstated. Okay. I don't think. Okay. Lots so of nuances if, here. <laughs> yeah, if you if you want to clarify that, if you, that didn't sound good for what we talked here, but let's go on to the next one. Uh, this is from Carol. Did the U.S. allow 
for dual naturalization? If so, did it depend on the country the person's original citizenship was? I do not know about dual naturalization. I mean, obviously, so, but dual citizenship or dual naturalization? I guess, I, I assume you mean dual citizenship. Um, no, her, her the way the, was, did, the, way did the US forms allow are for dual naturalization. Yeah, I, I mean, the way the forms are written, it doesn't seem like it because you have to renounce allegiance on the forms. Okay. Um, so I'm not sure if you could naturalize in another place at the same time? That's a good question. I think that's a question for the lawyers. I, I think this comes, this comes back from A, and I think if it's possible, can you go back to the slide in that 1798-1804 time period early on that you had? Uh, Sounds sure. like she'd like to see it posted or something. Okay, hold on a second. The 1798 statute? Yeah, in that time, I think because her reference was also to the 1804 slide that you had. Okay, so here's the 1798. So A, I'm not sure where we're going with this then. What do we need to ask? Or does that go back to that question you had on... Yeah, I forgot what the question her, was. <laughs> her question after that was uh, so the 1798 naturalization statute. Did you say that there were no manifest lists before then? No, I did not say that. Um, there were none required by the United States before 1820. Before 1820, uh, there could you know, a, a captain of a ship could create his own manifest. He didn't have to give it to the United States government for central keeping. So what happened to that list was kind of up to fate. You know, it could have been, these lists could, uh, there are many compilations of passenger lists that were created before 1820. Uh, there are uh, many that never got compiled. Uh, so there are a lot of resources for finding passenger lists before 1820, but there's no guarantee that, that any of them, that a certain list would have been, been maintained or kept. Okay. Uh, here's a question from Cheryl. Uh, what advantages would there have been for a woman to become a citizen if her husband died or they were divorced? The time frame is the 1870 to 1920 time period in Hamilton County, Ohio. You mentioned voting rights and property rights. Anything else? Well, women could not vote until 1922, citizen or not. So there's no reason for a woman to get voting rights before in that earlier time frame. Um, the, on, the only other reason a woman who, um, who, who was a widow would want to become a citizen might have to do with land. If you're questioning why a woman in a certain time and place became a citizen, um, you know, when she was, after her husband had passed away, and I'm assuming the husband was an alien when he died, um, if a woman is naturalizing after that point, you really want to look into local law or state law to figure out what is going on because there's something, there's some reason that she feels the need to naturalize. And so it, I mean, it can be kind of, it's a lot of work sometimes to get into those laws and to, to just read laws and figure out why a woman might have that impetus to, um, to okay. become a citizen. Okay. Here's a, another question from D is retrieving intention slash naturalization records in Cook County easier than vital records or any more difficult than other counties? 
So um, to, to retrieve the original records for Cook County, um, and there again, it depends if it's a county court, we're talking about going to the 13th floor. Um, they might take mail-in requests if you have the exact citation to the record uh, where they'll mail it to you. I would start by calling, you know, if it's a county level naturalization you're trying to get a hold of, I would call them and see. But otherwise, um, you can go in there and like, Tony, like your experience, you know, within 10 minutes, you'll have it in your hands mm -hmm. if you have the ability to go in there. Is it any easier or more difficult? It really depends on the county. Um, like, you know, some counties have their records already microfilmed and they're digitized and they're on family search and you can just pull them up. Cook counties are not that way. Um, if you're trying to get a naturalization declaration of intention that was filed at the federal court, that's at the national, those are at the National Archives, the, the Chicago branch, uh, the Great, Great Lakes branch in Chicago. And um, those you can email a request and send them a payment and they'll email them to you. Um, so I don't know if that's, you know, it just kind of depends on where it is. If you can find, if you can find a county whose naturalization records are microfilmed and they've been digitized and they're on family search or they're on ancestry, that's way easier than having to walk into a, into a building. But if you mm -hmm. live in the Chicago area and you're able to walk into that building, uh, it's relatively easy to get that record. Okay. Uh, from A, not a question or anything, but she also forwarded to me a, a link to the Jewish Gen website that you may have mentioned earlier. So I will include that link that she's sending when I send out that follow-up yeah, email. Yeah, is that not in my handout? I thought uh, it was. It's a, it's a, her, the address she sent me was uh, jewishgen.org slash info files slash manifest slash BSI. Okay. I, I wish I had printed out my... Yeah, and I, I don't have it, I don't have it here. I'm, in front. I'm as bad as you. I don't have it in front of me either. Here. <laughs> uh, let's see from Linda. Uh, thank you for the informative talk, Teresa and Tony. I really enjoyed a refresh and learning some new tidbits. Uh, also from A, she sent another link for me that I can include to the Steve Morris org, the Steve Morris org website, the one step. Yeah. And she specifically mentioned the one step three. Okay. Uh, she, and she also has Steve Morris has Soundex program scroll down. So I'll include that. Yeah. He's got a ton of uh, tools out there. Okay. We're back on, we're back on a again. If you can go back on these slides again, uh, okay. Teresa, the slide before 1804. Well, hold on. Now my clickers clicking somewhere else. I'm trying to look up my, I thought I saw it on the bottom moving around. So, so A is saying the slide before, oh, the before 1804, which is 1802. Okay. So, so while we're leaving that up, let me go to the next question here. Uh, from Carol, what changed with the 1906 appeal with minors becoming citizens? What happened? I'm sorry, say that again. What changed with the 1906 appeal? with minors becoming citizens. Oh, so in so they just repealed that ability for a, for somebody who who arrived as a minor um, to become a citizen in one in one step. They got rid of that. So now a minor who arrives uh, would become a citizen uh, when their father did, just like before, or if their father never naturalized, now um, somebody who arrived as a minor would have to wait until they're 21 and then go through the normal process, just like anybody else. Okay. Um, let me see, uh, Tony, what was the, what was the Family Search Wiki article? Uh, I think the, the entry wiki name was called, um, Let's see, where is that? United States Naturalization and Citizenship. Yeah, okay, that's in my handout on page three okay. under general resources. And from Peg and Sharon, they are saying that one of the links we were talking about earlier, I don't know if it was the Jewish Gen link, but it is in your list, in your handout. Okay. 
from Peg, thank you for this information. From A, got the slide. Thanks. Was tr oh, thank you, A. All A was trying to do was on that 1802 slide you got there was trying to see the stat number. Oh, it's in my handout. <laughs> All right. It's on so page one. So every stat number should be on um, my handout. Okay. So now I'm going to go back to the few more questions that are in the Q&A submitted. Okay. Uh, let's see. Oh, this is from Mary. Uh, and I guess it's an example of her ancestor. Irish great-grandfather arrived 1879, according to the 1900 census. Not sure where he lived from 1879 to 1892. Next, I find him in the 1892 naturalized Butte, Montana, but they have no petition or declaration. Since forms weren't sent to the National Archives until 1906, do I need to look in every state from 1879 to 1892 for the declaration and petition? Whew, wow. Uh, well. <laughs> well, you guys are asking some tough questions here. Holy well, every state, I mean, I guess every state that's logical, maybe, where he would have traveled. Um, okay, so let's back up. He's... He, they find him in 1892 naturalized. Well, he wait. First, he was in the 1900 census, arrived in 1879. Yeah. Not sure where he lived from 79 to 1892. Next, find him in Butte, Montana, but as naturalized. But they so have how no do we know petition. he's naturalized? If there's no naturalization record or declaration of intention. He's 1892. He's naturalized. How do you know that? Uh, because he, she's saying that he's, she, he's apparently, she's apparently seeing something in some kind of record with Butte, Montana. Well, if he's, yeah, I mean, I would, I would check Butte, Montana first for, for naturalization records. And, the, and again, the rest of her question was since forms weren't sent to the National Archives until 1906, does she need to look in every state from 1879 to 1892 for a declaration? But I think what you're saying is based on how she phrased the question. If there's some indication he's in Butte, Montana, and he's indicated as being naturalized, right. then look within those county court records there as your first step, yeah. rather than going yeah. back all these number of years back. And I guess, I guess she doesn't know where he arrived in 1879. I mean, I, it's, it sounds, and where was he in 1900? You know, was he in Butte, Montana in 1900, or was he somewhere else? Don't know. And if you can I, find, if, and I assume she's already looked for a naturalization, for um, immigration passenger list of him arriving in 1879, which a lot of times those, those years are off. You know, by the time it gets to 1900, uh, I've been here about 20 two years 2019 i don't know All right. they come up so, with a number so 1879 so, might not be exactly right so if you're looking if you're trying to find um an immigration record his passenger list don't just focus on 1879 is my point do a wide range and then i assume you've tried to find him in the 1880 census do some very creative searching in the 1880 census you know, considering different names he might have been using, you know, just different first names or just initials and age and place of birth and that sort of thing. If you can find him in 1880, that'll help. All right. That so help? while you've got, while you've got the slide up for 1802, we're back again to try to get to a certain slide. Okay. Go to the slide before 1804. This for is the it. 1804 statute. This is the slide before 1804. Here's 1804. There's 1802. Oh, and, and maybe, the, well, maybe when you were going through, maybe this question was posed earlier before we saw that again. Hey, I'm not sure if, we're, if this is helping or not, or if that was your answer to see the stats on that. All right, next question. 
from uh, A again. If I have the declaration but cannot find the sound decks and other index cards, is there a way to back in to find those cards? I guess you're in Cook County. Um, so you've got the declaration. Are we declaration. before 1906? Sorry about my dog. But cannot find the sound decks and other index cards. Um, so, okay, so if you're doing research in Cook County and you do have a declaration of intention, and if it's, um, if it's before 1906, um, you know, then it's a little bit trickier because they're not, you know, they're not usually filed together. The, the other thing is if you, um, if you have a declaration of intention, it doesn't necessarily mean that they became a citizen. They could have just stopped with the declaration of intention and not gone to that last, that second step. So if you've gone through the SoundX cards and you've not found them there, you know, they may have naturalized somewhere outside of that. When you're saying the SoundX cards, I'm assuming you're talking about those those Cook County ones that I demonstrated mm -hmm. earlier. Yeah, I think so. So um, maybe maybe they maybe they didn't become a citizen, and maybe you know, so they didn't file those final papers. That would be one option. Maybe they went somewhere else to do that. But if if you don't think that they lived anywhere else other than Cook County or Chicago area, then they probably um, filed them there or just didn't go through that process. Okay. Uh, we're going to switch a little bit back to the question that was about the Butte archives. So that was from Mary. She's clarifying a little bit more. She says the Butte archives and court have no petition or declaration. So maybe that's where she has to research going back in that time period across other areas. But I guess I'm back to why, how do you, does she know that the person is naturalized? What is the document oh, he, saying? She had, no, she has the naturalization record from the archives in Butte. Oh. But the archives in court have no petition or declaration. Well, she's got the petition, right? I'm confused. Uh, no, she doesn't have the petition. All she knows is that the person is naturalized and is in Butte. She has the naturalization record from the archives in Butte. Right, which would be the petition, I guess. The final paper. Mary, maybe, maybe how about this? Why don't you email me? Because I think we're, we're, this is going to be rather difficult to just go a little line by line and add a little bit more in it. Maybe email and email the document that you have. Thing. Right. And that way I could maybe share it with Teresa and we could give, give you a better interpretation of it. So, yeah, that would be you, good. And then I can yeah. help you better because I am not. Yeah, this is I mean, we're just not going to be able to put all the pieces together right now. Um, this is from Vicki. Uh, and this, again, this goes back to Mary's question. Did the lady with the Butte, Montana person take land? Wouldn't there be a reference in a BLM record? Yeah, so the case files, if you're, if you're, um, if you're acquiring land that required citizenship, there are case files at the National Archives for the, for the land, um, you know, the land entry case files. And those can be very detailed. So you yeah. need to get those from the National Archives. Those are not online. Hey, Mary, this is for Mary S. with the Butte thing. I know that there's about three or four more line items you've proposed, but let's do this. Let's send me via email a more complete picture of what you've got with maybe even JPEGs of the documents or something. And then I could share that with Teresa. And maybe we could, maybe through that process, because I don't think we're going to be able to solve your, your question here. Yeah, I um, need to see what she's got to be able to understand. I'm a little slow. I need to see. <laughs> yeah. Um, I th actually think we're all caught up. Oh, wait. Yeah, we're all caught up with, I think, questions now. 
Q and A's, all the stuff we've gone through, the chat updates. Uh, let's see, great program, Teresa. Thanks, Tony. Um, great info. Thank you very much. I think that's it. And once again, we've blown through our time zone here. So you can <laughs> tell we're way, way past. But, you know, I contributed to that myself with my announcements. So that took five minutes plus out of our time schedule here. Um, if what there can are they no do? Fire you? <laughs> if there are no more questions, I think we'll be calling an end to the program. And obviously, if you have further questions, you can always email to me. And we can get them off to uh, to Teresa and stuff like that. Uh, from A, again, excellent professional presentation and slide layout, quality information. Thank you. Thank you. A, you, you were good. You got a lot of stuff that you sent me and you really have good, good <laughs> insights into stuff here. Um, I guess at this point in time, I don't know that we need to go any further with everything. I guess, Teresa, we're just getting more thank yous coming in, but... Thank you. Um, I think it's time to call it quits. Okay. Well, maybe thank you, everybody. Thanks for having maybe, me, Tony. Hey, maybe there's two calling it quits. We'll call it quits for you and maybe me, but at a future date. So we'll leave it at that. <laughs> thank you again so much for this, Teresa. And that, right. that, that handout was out, uh, outstanding. I'll tell you that. Thank you. So thanks again. And everybody, uh, again, again, the genealogy chit chat program, July 27th, it may be full, but there could, you could go on a wait list and we are going to talk about county history books. Uh, and then the August 10th presentation on colonial ancestors, my final swan song will happen on that night. So, so sign up for the program and join the ship as it leaves the port. Hey, can I say one more thing? County sure. histories, those are great. County histories would also might also list the courts that were in the area that were, you know, at the time that that was published. So there you go. Well, maybe, join, maybe join my presentation on that. All right. <laughs> so, all right, everybody. Thank you to all. I think we're going to call it quits to tonight's program. Um, and thank you for joining us. And we'll all see you next time, whenever that may be. Okay, great. Thank All you. Right. Bye, Thanks, Teresa. Tom. Thank Bye -bye. you. Bye, everybody.